So this is the lecture for module three, where uh, we read chapters five through ten in the second part of process and reality. We're in the part called discussions and applications, and <clears throat> in these five chapters, uh, following up on the five, uh, the first five chapters in this part, we are looking at. Um, Whitehead's understanding of propositions and propositional feelings, and I know that uh, chapter in particular was pretty difficult. I'll try to elucidate parts of it for you. We also saw what Whitehead, uh, how Whitehead understands process, right, in chapter 10, which is one of the chapters I really want to focus on. It's, I think, the easiest to grasp um, and the most important in this um, set of five chapters. Uh, where Whitehead talks about two types of process, concrescence and transition. Um, and I think in that chapter really summarizes um, the big, you know, the major brush strokes of his cosmological scheme. So we're going to zero in on that. Uh, but Whitehead also continues his uh, discussion of some early modern philosophers. He talks about Locke, he talks about Hume, he talks about Kant and Descartes. And so we're going to look at some of that um, and try to make sense of what he's inheriting from these early modern thinkers and what he is uh, criticizing and trying to reform. So you'll, you'll recall in chapter four that we covered in the last module where Whitehead is discussing Descartes and Kant and um, entering into his uh, explication of their theories of perception, that um, he's very critical of this uh, modern bifurcation between primary and secondary qualities or characteristics, right? Where the primary qualities are basically things we attribute to material objects, mass and weight, velocity and so on. And the secondary qualities or characteristics are things we associate with mind, right? Like colors and scents and sounds, emotions and values and so on. Whitehead is trying to bring forth a cosmological scheme wherein uh, mind and matter are primary and secondary characteristics where quantities studied by mathematical physicists and qualities uh, elicited by poets um, and experienced in our everyday lives where these two things hang together as part of the same creative process or creative advance of nature. So he's going to start drawing analogies between the general principles of physics uh, and the uh, structure of our experience and our consciousness. So he draws an analogy very specifically between um, physical energy vectors and metaphysical feeling vectors, you might say. And uh, I'm including a diagram here that I've drawn to show you how this works, uh, what, what the process of concrescence looks like if we were to try to, um, you know, put it into one dimension and, and sketch it. So you'll see on the left is the past, in the center is the present, and on the right is the future. In the past, you have uh, a set of objects. And in Whitehead's scheme, these objects are perished subjects. He also calls them superjects, right? And the past world is, uh, is an array of these already perished uh, experiences. And each new moment of concrescence or of experience uh, inherits this past in its plurality, its multiplicity. And the initial process of um, a new moment of experience arising prehends the vectors streaming in from these perished occasions. And these vectors have different intensities, they have different characters, depending on what the experiences of these past occasions, uh, what, they, what they were like. Now, the S1 and the S2 in A, B, and C, these past occasions, refers to um, certain characteristics uh, or eternal objects that were ingressed by these past occasions. These could be, you know, A is a past occasion that could have been experiencing S1, which is red, and S2, which is green. Um, and because these three occasions, uh, 
A, B, and C were in uh, basically the same environment, they're all prehending from their unique perspective the same two eternal objects, right? S1, S2, which I've said are red and green. Now, these red-green experiences from these three perspectives, A, B, and C, stream in as energy vectors or as feeling vectors into the newly emerging, uh, newly concressing occasion of experience. And we don't only prehend A, B, and C, we prehend the perspectives of A, B, and C so that we can kind of see what they were seeing, right? So this is, in the present, uh, the occasion called M, we see how the prehensions of A, B, and C are brought together uh, so that we see what A saw, we see what B saw, we see what C saw. We also, I didn't write it in here, but when we prehend C, we, we are also prehending C's prehensions of B and A, right? There's a sort of uh, holographic um, enfolding that happens here. And then you see within the present occasion a process of harmonization of contrasts coming together into a satisfaction. This satisfaction is the, um, the unified perspective achieved by this present, presently concressing occasion of experience, where it, it gathers up all of these past uh, objects or superjects in its environment, and it achieves its own unique perspective on what's going on. As soon as it achieves that perspective, as soon as it achieves satisfaction, it perishes. It becomes a new object to be inherited in the future by subsequently concressing occasions, right? So this sort of gives you a picture of how Whitehead is uh, analogizing energy vectors in physics to our experience from moment to moment of inheriting a past and anticipating a future. So Whitehead begins to discuss his theory of perception in relationship to the early modern philosopher's theories of perception. Um, he talks about presentational immediacy and causal efficacy and says that for the most part, um, these early modern philosophers ignored causal efficacy um, they did not attend closely enough to the mode of perception of causal efficacy and instead uh, attended almost exclusively to presentational immediacy. And Whitehead thinks that um, as a result, experience was explained in a, he says, thoroughly topsy-turvy fashion. Presentational immediacy was considered to be the primary mode of perception, even the exclusive mode of perception by which the mind has access to the external world. Presentational immediacy is perception through uh, the outward facing senses, right? And only highly evolved organisms have uh, sensory organs that are um, refined enough to grant them uh, perception in the mode of presentational immediacy. And Whitehead's trying to understand perception, human perception, in its evolutionary context as part of an evolutionary continuum. So rather than, um, as the early modern philosophers did, begin with our sensory experience, uh, Whitehead wants to begin with something more fundamental, evolutionarily speaking, so that we can understand how our human perception uh, is... Uh, sort of rooted upon or based upon uh, more primitive modes of perception. And the real innovation here for Whitehead is, you know, whereas Hume argued that we could have no uh, experience of necessary connection or of causality, Whitehead, by making uh, causal efficacy the primary mode of perception, shows that uh, actually we do perceive causal influences streaming in from our environment. You know, he thinks that these are early modern thinkers, for the most part, perhaps with Locke as an exception, they were over-intellectualizing their analysis of our experience. And because presentational immediacy gives us sort of clear and distinct ideas that we can use uh, and language more easily um, to describe the nature of our experience, that's what they focused on. Whereas causal efficacy, it's a vaguer mode of, of perception. Um, it's 
more confused. It's more difficult to distinguish self from other when you're perceiving in the mode of uh, causal efficacy. And so, you know, philosophers have focused on vision, right, as the, um, the sort of uh, paradigm example of how we are connected to the outside world. Um, and in vision, we see a spatial world arrayed uh, with distinct objects. Um, this is very different from what Whitehead describes as the feelings of the viscera, right? From Whitehead's point of view, we perceive the world through all of our organs, not just our eyes, not just our ears. We perceive uh, emotionally through our liver, through our gut, you know, through our heart, all in different ways. But these modes of perception are vague. They don't give us a spatial world where we can discriminate distinct objects, right? They give us a world of emotional vectors uh, and vortexes. So uh, Whitehead's trying to correct an oversight in the history of philosophy and say, hey, philosophers, pay attention to your bodies, right? Because it's in your body, uh, in the way that your bodies are organized, that you come at first to know the world. And then through presentational immediacy, you come uh, to discriminate the discrete features of that world. And there's a third mode of perception that Whitehead calls symbolic reference. And it's symbolic reference um, that we're usually actually perceiving the world through. Symbolic reference is what allows us to connect the present spatially arrayed moment, right? Granted to us by presentational immediacy, it allows us to connect that to uh, the causally efficacious feeling streaming into us from uh, the environment. We might um, be holding a stone in our hand uh, as an example that Whitehead uses. And when we look at that stone and perceive it in the mode of presentational immediacy, it's a gray patch. Causal efficacy is how we perceive this, the weight of the stone. Maybe it's cold. We're feeling that as it's inherited through the various occasions of experience composing the society that is our body right? Very complexly organized society of actual occasions. Symbolic reference allows us to connect that feeling of the weight, right? And the temperature of the stone to the visual perception of its grayness and to the spatial perception of its location. We use symbolic reference to do that. And symbolic reference, unlike the pure modes of presentational immediacy or causal efficacy, it can be mistaken. We can make errors in trying to link these two modes of perception and what they reveal of the world together, right? Uh, it could be that we're in some kind of a special experimental mirror box and we think we're holding a stone in our hand in front of us, but actually it's someone else's hand behind us, right? Or maybe you've seen this experiment where um, they put you in a mirror box and it, there's a fake arm uh, on one side or your own arm is reflected and it makes it look like um, it's about to get hit by a hammer and the uh, you know, experimenter slams the hammer into the fake arm, and because the mirrors made it seem like it was your arm, you wince as though you're about to be in tremendous pain. Um, this is an error of symbolic reference because we have been fooled into connecting um, the data of presentational immediacy, right, seeing this arm over there, with the data of causal efficacy, which we would expect to be connected to it. So, in this sense, um, Symbolic reference as the third sort of synthesizing mode of perception is it's about finding the relevance of sense perception to actual happenings in nature. And Whitehead describes this, this symbolic reference, this mode of perception as an art, right? Which understands the world as a medium. So, you know, uh, Whitehead's understanding of perception is thoroughly aesthetic in nature and artistic uh, in nature. We are engaged as we try to perceive the world around us in an artistic project. And the medium that we are using uh, to compose our artworks uh, is the world itself. So let's quickly go through what Whitehead has to say uh, to John Locke and David Hume and uh, Rene Descartes and Immanuel Kant, right? These are the four thinkers that he's principally uh, dealing with, that he's entering into dialogue with, to both draw insight from them and also to uh, critically respond. So 
The empiricists, Locke and Hume, they said to us that external objects are known to us only through the senses, right? There's nothing in the mind except impressions, sensory impressions. And what the mind does, the mind's role, it's basically passive. It takes these impressions, it associates them, um, and generates ideas. And ideas are just more complex impressions, basically. Um, you know, Hume does make a distinction between ideas and impressions, but it's based solely on the magnitude of force that they apply to the mind. So for Hume, impressions arising from our sensory perception of external objects, they're, they're more forceful. They have more force and vivacity, he says, than ideas, which are merely faint images uh, in our reflective cognition. They're repetitions of uh, sensory impressions that are uh, less intense than the original impression was. Whitehead uh, here critiques Hume and his theory of um, how impressions become ideas, which is the associationist theory, uh, because he thinks it downplays, that Hume downplayed the significant power of the creative imagination, of imaginative freedom, uh, in Whitehead's terms. Because, uh, you know, poets and mathematicians, they seem to be capable of free conceptual production of any type of eternal objects, right? Of any type of possibilities. So given their actual experience, the poet is able to imagine alternatives. The mathematician is able to ingress novel patterns uh, that are relevant to experience, but that really are, it's hard to derive them from experience. And Hume and the other empiricists are saying, well, we only have ideas derived from our sensory experience. Whitehead is saying, I don't know about that. Um, yes, there is a uh, gradation of diverse like types of occasions of experience and higher grade occasions of experience, like those associated with human beings. They have this imaginative freedom to ingress novelty. Lower grade occasions of experience have less imaginative uh, freedom, less capacity to ingress novelty, and they're more repetitive. Um, but for human beings, which Whitehead, Whitehead does want to see on a continuum with simpler forms of organism, uh, we seem to be doing more than just rearranging sensory impressions to generate our ideas. We seem to have uh, the capacity to be creative beyond what our um, environment as received through our senses uh, provides to us. Now, Whitehead really zeroes in on this notion of repetition uh, that Hume discusses. Um, for Hume, you know, as I mentioned just before, repetition is what allows a, a, a sensor impression to become an idea, right? It's repeated in our experience. Um, repetition is, is also related to memory, it's related to habit. Um, but Hume tells us memory and sensation, they tell, they tell us nothing about necessary connection, which is another way of talking about causality. So for Hume, we have no experience of, of causality through sensory impressions. Causality is an idea uh, for Hume that is a result of constant conjunction or habit. Um, but Whitehead points out there's no we have no sense or impression of habit either. So Hume's saying causation really amounts to nothing but habitual perception um, because we have no immediate experience or sensory impression of causality. And yet to rely on something called habit uh, to, to justify at least an illusory idea of uh, causation, Whitehead says is just as problematic. And what Whitehead ends up doing is saying that, uh, you know, causality is, is our feeling of the past world, right? Streaming into our experience. And he shows, as we discussed in the last module, uh, that even Hume admits that we see with our eyes. And what is that if not a, an admission of a directly experienced uh, causal vector, right? We experience the world through our senses and our sensory organs are causally connected to the outside world, right? The energy vectors streaming in from the outside world affect our senses, uh, which then become part of our own uh, consciousness through the complex amplifier uh, 
uh, of the human body. So Whitehead says that experience, this is a quote uh, from page 136, experience involves a becoming. That becoming means that something becomes, and that what becomes involves repetition transformed into novel immediacy. So experience involves a becoming, right? There is a flux, there is a process. All things flow. But what are those things, right? That becoming means that something becomes. And for Whitehead, those things are actual occasions. And that, he continues, what becomes involves repetition transformed into novel immediacy. So the repetition part for Whitehead is the first phase of concrescence of an actual occasion. It's the conformal phase. It's the phase of receiving the past, repeating the perished experience of past occasions in the present, feeling it again. But then there's this final phase where novel immediacy is generated. If the initial conformal phase of concrescence is just repeating what just happened in the past, the next phase of a movement towards subjective immediacy ingresses novelty, even if it's just uh, a different, what Whitehead calls subjective form or emotional tone that's added to that repetition of the past. That new emotional tone grants a kind of subjective immediacy to what had been a perished object, right, or superject. More ad uh, advanced, more complex actual occasions of experience, like human actual occasions of experience, can ingress more novelty. We can actually theorize about the emotion that we experience receiving the, the past, right? Most occasions of experience in the physical world, they're conformal. Um, there's very little novelty introduced, but there's some Right? There is no zero point of novelty in a creative universe. So experience involves a becoming. That becoming means that something becomes actual occasions. And that what becomes involves repetition, conformal re reception of the past, transformed into novel immediacy. Right, A new subjective drop of experience emerges out of the repetition of the past to contribute its own novel perspective to the ongoing creative advance of nature. So Whitehead then, in this discussion of repetition, says that uh, the notion of simple location is inconsistent with any admission of repetition. In other words, uh, you know, simple location refers to the way that objects are simply where they are and can be, their location can be defined independently of their relative position or of their position relative to other entities in their environment. And in Whitehead's pan-experiential universe, um, as we discussed in the last module, space is not just this empty container uh, that objects are situated within. Face, space is a field of potential brought forth by uh, the interrelationships among actual occasions of experience. And so this is a real like figure ground shift for us to try to make sense of. It's so easy for us, based on our visual experience, to imagine that we are inside some spatial container. Uh, right, and that um, the trees over there that I am perceiving right now are just over there, and I'm over here. But if we take Whitehead's theory of perception and prehension seriously, um, that tree is not just there, it's here, because I'm experiencing it here. It's part of each of my occasions of experience. I'm repeating that tree, at least the tree as it was when it's the, all the occasions that make up the society composing that tree perished a few moments ago, I'm receiving that energy vector, granting it subjective immediacy again, right, in my own experience, and through that act of repetition, I am making what looks like it's there, over there, that tree, I'm making it present here. And the tree is also feeling me, it's making me present there, which for the tree is here. So each actual occasion is bringing forth its own here by taking what is there, filtering it through uh, its own um, process of feeling and contrast and harmonizing it into a new subjective unity uh, of immediate experience. And so simple location, the idea that objects are simply where they are, Whitehead says, is inconsistent with this notion of repetition.
Because everything is feeling everything else. Everything is making present what appears outside of it. Uh, is, it's making it present within itself. And so there's this uh, entwined sort of holographic nature um, to space so that we cannot think anymore in terms of simple location. The process of prehension or feeling is one whereby what is there becomes here. So another way of talking about what Whitehead is criticizing in these early modern thinkers, specifically in their theories of perception, is to say that Whitehead is rejecting the representational understanding of the mind's relationship to the world, of the subject's relationship to objects. Uh, this representational approach is um, exemplified in Descartes, perhaps better than any other philosopher. Uh, you know, Descartes has these three fundamental types of actual entity, right? Cogitating minds, or the thinking substance, extended bodies, or matter, and God. And um, for Descartes, getting the mind into contact with the body and the, and the physical world uh, requires God. Um, God connects the ideas in the mind to the qualities of bodies in the world. And without God to play this role, Descartes really has no um, epistemic ground uh, to his philosophy. Um, so he really requires this God trick in order for um, his two substances, mind and body, to relate to one another and for knowledge to be possible. Um, you know, and from, from Whitehead's uh, point of view, um, the very possibility of knowledge should not be an accident of God's goodness. It should depend on the interwoven natures of things, right? So this is his response to, to Descartes. So rather than conceiving of the nature of reality as being composed of minds, which belong only to human beings, and everything else being extended matter, with God somehow mediating between the two, um, Whitehead's organic philosophy interprets experience as meaning uh, the self-enjoyment of being one among many and of being one arising out of the composition of many, right? These are his exact words. So rather than a representationalist scheme where what the mind does is uh, sort of internally uh, picture the external world and it pictures the external world in its own um, intellectualist or, or cognitive terms in terms of bare universals, uh, Whitehead would say, uh, the mind is actually, our experience is actually an inheritance of the outside world, and the transformation of that outsideness to our own uh, immediate uh, subjectivity, inward subjectivity. So the publicity of the world becomes the privacy of our experience, and then the privacy of our experience perishes back into the publicity of the world. So there's this uh, polar relationship between prehension, right, the outside world streaming into and being appropriated by us as subjects, and expression, right? Our subjective experience of that outside world perishing and becoming public again, right? Prehension, expression. Prehension, expression. This inward movement of appropriation and this outward gifting of our experience back uh, to the outside world. So this is what Whitehead means when he says that his organic philosophy interprets experience as meaning. The self-enjoyment of being one among many, right? This is our own subjective immediacy where we know what our immediacy of inward experience is a result of our inheritance of the many perished objects in our environment, right? And of being one arising out of the composition of many, right? So we're not just abstractly representing an outside world. Uh, rather, the outside world enters into us and then we enter back into the outside world. Right, so the actual entities composing the universe enter into each other's constitutions. There's not this veil separating uh, an internal mental world from an external physical world. The mental and the physical are uh, two phases in one process. And that process goes all the way down to the simplest forms of organization and all the way up to the most complex. So Whitehead will say that the creative process is rhythmic, 
It swings from the publicity of many things to the individual privacy, and it swings back from the private individual to the publicity of the objectified individual, right? So, whereas the substance philosophers of this early modern period, and going back to the ancients, presuppose a subject which then encounters an objective datum, right? A pre-existing subject encounters and internally represents an objective world. Process philosophers like Whitehead instead presuppose an objective datum which is met with feelings that grow together to issue in a unified subject, which then itself perishes to become a superject, which forms the objective datum for the next occasion of experience. So to conclude uh, on, on Descartes, this is a line that I really love that helps you understand uh, how Whitehead differentiates his philosophy of organism from Descartes' substance philosophy. Whitehead writes, Descartes conceives the thinker as creating the occasional thought, right? I think, therefore I am. The philosophy of organism inverts the order and conceives the thought as a constituent operation in the creation of the occasional thinker. So the thinker in this context, I think Whitehead means is the conscious, self-conscious uh, human being. And for the most part, we're not self-conscious. For the most part, we're immersed in our experience. Um, and we're having thoughts all the time. And rather than Whitehead beginning with the thinker as some sort of mental substance that then has thoughts, right, as qualities that qualify it, um, Whitehead is saying that there is no substance underlying our thinking. There is only the thinking. And some of these thoughts uh, that emerge in the course of our experience become conscious and experience themselves as a thinker. But that thinker perishes just like all the other occasions of experience uh, leading up to it. So there's nothing special about the thinker other than that it has this uniquely intense perspective upon what has come before it and what is possible uh, given it. So this is how Whitehead gets beyond the Cartesian form of um, substance ontology as it relates to a thinking versus a material substance. For Whitehead, there is no more substance. There's creativity. And creativity is this rhythmic pulsation that moves through subjective and objective phases. So in chapter 7, uh, the subjectivist principle, Whitehead um, introduces us to these two modern uh, discoveries. He credits Descartes uh, with the discovery of the subjectivist principle, which is the idea that subjective experience is a primary datum in philosophy. He says this is one of the greatest discoveries since Plato and Aristotle. And Whitehead will uh, appropriate this subjectivist principle, but he's going to reform it. So where for Descartes and the modern philosophers to follow in his wake, the subjectivist principle meant that the human subject, the human conscious thinking uh, subject, was the primary datum. For Whitehead, uh, what we mean by subject and subjectivity is generalized, so that it includes not just conscious subjects, uh, but the um, plethora of non-conscious subjectivities that constitute the universe, right? So Whitehead is a pan-experientialist or a pan-subjectivist, if you'd like, uh, which is to say that subjectivity goes all the way down and most of it is not conscious. Human conscious subjectivity, for Whitehead, it's a it's a subphase of a subphase of the process of concrescence associated with our very um, special high-grade forms of experience. Most experience doesn't come in the form of a conscious experience, right? So Whitehead's reformed subjectivist principle uh, is such that, you know, as Whitehead will say, outside of the experience of subjects, there is nothing, 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 bare nothingness, right? So he's pretty adamant about accepting some version of this principle, but he's generalizing subjectivity far beyond what we, well, what Descartes meant by merely a human conscious form of subjectivity. Um, so for, for Whitehead, he also needs to balance this subjectivist principle with an objectivist principle, because Whitehead is a realist. So 
He wants to affirm the actual existence of the datum of experience, the actual existence of an objective world out there, which for Descartes and Kant and these other representationalist thinkers cannot be affirmed, right? We only know the objective world as it is pictured by the mind in terms of its internal representations. And these internal representations come in the form of abstract universals. Even our sensory experience uh, comes in the form of of mere universals, right? Patches of colors and, and, and shape and so on. Whitehead is reasserting a realist ontology and saying that no, subjectivity is derivative from ob objectivity, right? Objectivity is not a construct of the forms of thought and intuitions of, of a subject as Kant had it. So with Whitehead's reformed subjectivist principle, we need to explain what consciousness is for him, right? So Whitehead tells us um, consciousness, right, is a very special form of subjectivity. And he says, he tells us on page 161 that consciousness is the feeling of negation, right? It finally rises to the peak of free imagination in which the conceptual novelties search through a universe in which they are not datatively exemplified or datively exemplified. They're not in the objective datum. Consciousness is able to ingress these conceptual novelties or eternal objects and compare them to the actually given state of affairs that it has received in the conformal phase of its concrescence, right? So those concrescences, those actual occasions of experience that do attain consciousness, attain consciousness because they're able to uh, feel the negation of what's given in the conformal phase by the ingressed possibilities, the ingressed eternal objects, which then, in contrast to what's actually given, these possibilities generate what Whitehead will come to call a propositional feeling. A propositional feeling is sort of a hybrid feeling that straddles um, given actualities, right? The actual occasions of the past. It includes those, but it's, it's a hybrid prehension of those past already concrest occasions with future possibilities that have not yet been actualized, right? Or uh, possibilities that could have been actualized, but were not, right? This is the propositional feeling as Whitehead understands it. And consciousness is a form of propositional feeling that is hybrid between actuality and potentiality. So consciousness is the feeling of the negation of actuality by potentiality. So Whitehead says, I quote, Consciousness is the subjective form involved in feeling the contrast between the theory, which may be erroneous, and the fact, which is given, right? Thus, consciousness involves the rise into importance of the contrast between eternal objects as pure possibilities, designated by the words any and just that. So the contrast between a more general uh, eternal object and a more particular eternal object. So in other words, when I experience the green of a leaf consciously, that consciousness involves a contrast between experiencing that, just that green, with the general idea of color as such. So when I really am conscious of the greenness, it's because I'm considering the possibility that it may not have been green that that leaf may have been red, it may have been orange, right? It's green because it's the middle of summer, it's not fall. And all of these considerations uh, are a function of consciousness, contrasting what is given with what is possible. So the key point here for understanding Whitehead's reformed subjectivist principle is that whereas for the early modern philosophers, you know, Descartes through Kant, uh, consciousness was put at the center of philosophy and subjectivity and consciousness were equated. For Whitehead, uh, subjectivity is far more general and consciousness is really, uh, it arises in a late derivative phase of concrescence. It's not the primitive element. Uh, for Whitehead, um, the primitive element in physical experience is emotional sympathy felt in its relevance to a world beyond, right? So whereas these early modern thinkers thought that consciousness was just internally representing an external world, which became a mere conjecture, 
right? We don't have direct access to it for Kant, for Descartes, for Hume, for Whitehead. Uh, the primitive element in experience is our direct emotional contact with the world beyond us, and we feel it streaming into us, and we know intuitively that there is a world beyond us. We don't have to infer it. We don't have to construct a model of the world in some internal mental language, right, of representations. The world streams into us, and each moment of our subjective experience is a transformation of a dead, objective world into a renewed living immediacy, right? And as soon as we achieve that living immediacy, it then perishes and becomes part of that objective world, taken up by the next moment of experience, right? So Whitehead's reformed subjectivist principle brackets consciousness and says that's a derivative phase and focuses on what's more basic about our subjective experience, which, which is the emotional inheritance of the past streaming into us from our environment. So Whitehead's been sort of dropping hints about his own theory of perception throughout this uh, second part of Process and Reality, but in Chapter 8 on Symbolic Reference, he really goes into more detail, right? He distinguishes presentational immediacy and causal efficacy as the two pure modes of perception and says that most of our experience is actually in this third hybrid mode or synthetic mode of perception called Symbolic Reference. I've already talked about these a little bit, but let me just briefly go into more detail. Now, um, causal efficacy is the most primitive mode of perception in Whitehead's view. Even um, simple physical uh, atoms and molecules experience causal efficacy. They don't experience presentational immediacy. Presentational immediacy is something that occurs later when complex sensory organs have evolved. Um, presentational immediacy has more to do with the perception of space in the present, now. Causal efficacy has more to do with the perception of time, the inheritance of the past, right? So Whitehead will say that um, each of these two pure modes in and of itself is incapable of error, right? Error as I mentioned earlier, only enters into the picture with symbolic reference. Whitehead writes that, uh, quote, error is the mark of the higher organisms and is the schoolmaster by whose agency there is upward evolution. So in other words, when higher organisms fail to correctly or um, symbolically relate what they experience now in the present with uh, what they inherit from the past, then they die. Uh, and it's the refinement of this capacity to relate our experience of causal efficacy with our experience of presentational immediacy that allows for the further evolution of our sensory organs to develop. So Whitehead says that in order for symbolic reference to work, there must be some sort of common ground that links uh, presentational immediacy and causal efficacy. Otherwise, how could we really have any basis for comparing them, right? And he says that this common ground is the presented locus. Uh, the presented locus is the array of um, actual occasions in the environment that we experience right now, right? So while causal efficacy, the mode of perception of causal efficacy, has direct perception of the antecedent occasions in our environment, of what has just transpired, of the just past, this mode of causal efficacy has indirect perception um, of what's actually present. Presentational immediacy, on the other hand, has direct perception of what is present, but indirect perception of the causal past. And so um, they're both relating, though, to a presented locus, both modes, and it's through that relationship that we're able to um, have a ground for relating them. So Whitehead then tells us that for the purposes of scientific measurement, we're always dealing with the, we're striving at least to deal with the mode of um, perception and the mode of presentational immediacy. We're trying to understand where things are precisely right now in this moment, right? Whereas scientific theorizing uh, and technology involves uh, perception in the mode of causal efficacy, because um, with theorizing, we're trying to understand, well, given where things are now and how we've measured them now, where will they be in the future, right? 
So we're trying to understand causal influence through time when we do theorizing. Whereas when we do measurement, we're trying to see, well, what's happening right now? How can we get as precise an account of what is actually occurring here and now, right? So science makes use of both modes of perception. Um, Whitehead says that detailed geometrical relations, they're vague for perception in the mode of causal efficacy. Um, and yet... Uh, causal efficacy does still give us an ability to distinguish between the past and the future. So while mathematical measurement is indifferent to this temporal distinction, physical theory is really wholly concerned with it. So science makes use of both, both modes of perception in its attempt to understand the universe. So I want to revisit this uh, criticism that Whitehead has of modern philosophers, Hume and Kant in particular, with regard to their understanding of causation. Whitehead's principal reason for looking again at perception and, and articulating this more primary mode of causal efficacy is precisely in order to restore some connection between causation and perception, that in fact our perception begins primarily with uh, causal efficacy, right? Causation is part of our experience. And he says that the inversion of the true constitution of experience is what has disconnected causation from perception and led to all these problems of solipsism and skepticism and so on that plagued the modern philosophers. Uh, Whitehead says that clearness in consciousness that we gain through presentational immediacy is no evidence for primitiveness in the genetic process. The opposite is more, mere, more nearly true, he says. Uh, so in other words, just because presentational immediacy is clear and distinct and easier to philosophize about and categorize and conceptualize, it doesn't mean that that is therefore the most primitive element in our experience, right? The more difficult element in our experience to conceptualize, namely causal efficacy, more difficult to conceptualize because it's vaguer, it's more emotional, it's more embodied, this is what philosophers have ignored, and Whitehead's trying to correct that ignorance. And Whitehead points out that none of these philosophers, these early modern thinkers, were actually consistent in their insistence that presentational immediacy is primary, uh, or that it is the sole source of information, because they're all constantly referring to memory and habit and practice and so on, things which um, are not part of the mode of uh, perception uh, of presentational immediacy. So they're making reference to causal efficacy all the time. They just didn't thematize it uh, in the way that Whitehead does. And so he's trying to elicit this more into our consciousness. You know, so Whitehead will say, if we have no experience of causation, why uh, do the eyes blink when we switch the light on in a dark room? Right? What is that if not a direct experience of the causal effect of light upon the retina. So for Whitehead, we're not blind to the causal uh, dimension of the universe, right? We live amid experiences of causation. And, you know, his, his beautiful sort of poetic example of this, um, his way of thinking about how we live amid the causal influences of the universe is, he says, quote, in the vagueness of the low hum of insects in an August woodland, the inflow into ourselves of feelings from enveloping nature overwhelms us, right? So this inflow into ourselves of feelings, this embodied perception of how nature envelopes uh, and overwhelms us, it, that's our experience of causation. Our subjectivity is itself caused by this inflow of feelings from our environment. This is really one of the most significant uh, reorientations that Whitehead is, is trying to uh, invite us into. So usually we think of um, symbolism as something that only uh, language can grant us. Um, but Whitehead is, is thinking of symbolism in a far more generic way, that symbolism is active in the perception and the prehension of actual occasions that are far less complex than human uh, language using animals. So he's a lot like another American thinker, Charles Saunders Peirce, who developed a semiotic theory 
where meaning and sign interpretation and symbolism to some degree goes all the way down. Uh, and that causal exchanges between elements of nature take place semiotically, that there's an exchange of meaning and interpretation that goes all the way down. Whitehead's doing something similar here. So language is an example of uh, symbolic reference, but it's building atop a form of perceptual symbolism that was already present. So Whitehead will tell us that uh, words can produce enhanced relevance um, in, some, in some experiences, and that a word can symbolize a thing or a thing can symbolize a word, right? So when a poet goes for a walk in the woods searching for inspiration, like they see a tree, they perceive a tree, and that symbolizes in that moment a whole string of words. Uh, it could symbolize most obviously the the actual tree can symbolize the, the word tree. And then later when we read the poem, the word tree symbolizes the actual tree. So this symbolic reference, it goes in both directions, right? It's not like only words can be symbols, right? Actual things in the world can be symbols for words too. Whitehead says that language is used to communicate between two persons, obviously, but it's also used by one person for communication along the route of his or her own actual occasions, right? So in other words, we use language not only to communicate our intentions and meanings to others, we use language to understand our own meanings. We use language to communicate from this moment of my experience to the next moment of my experience. Language helps us uh, narrate our experience so that it forms, that we're able to remember what's important through the various occasions of the historical root uh, of our soul, which for Whitehead, our soul is a society of actual occasions of experience stretching back to to our birth and being enhanced along the way by certain significant memories. And when we learn language, memory uh, becomes really restructured by the structure of our language, right? Our capacity to tell stories about ourselves. Um, it really alters how we understand who we are. So Whitehead is saying that language is an, ing an ingredient in our very special form of human actual occasions that helps us knit together this historical root to remember the significant things. So let's move on to chapter nine on the propositions. Now this is a very difficult chapter. Uh, if you're not getting it, that's okay. I'm gonna try to explain the most important points and we'll just move on. I think chapter 10 um, is a lot more digestible and so focus on that chapter, uh, the chapter on process. But I just wanna give us a few takeaways from this ninth chapter on propositions. Uh, and we can discuss this more in our video conferences. So propositions are um, a hybrid entity somewhere between given actuality and pure possibility. A proposition is a, is a comparison between what's given in the physical world and what we physically prehend. It's a comparison of that to what we conceptually prehend for what's possible given what is actual. Or a, a propositional feeling could be a feeling of what could have been, but was not, right? So when we experience, um, you know, the feeling of stepping out into traffic, hearing the car horn, and stepping back and having that adrenal adrenaline rush surge through us, we're experiencing a propositional feeling there, which is that, wow, I wasn't hit by that car, but I could have been, right? It's a comparison between what's given and what's possible. And, you know, one of the innovations in Whitehead's philosophy is to suggest that uh, alternative historical possibilities are relevant to the facts as they actually occurred, right? They exist in the actual world as uh, these historical possibilities as uh, a penumbra of eternal objects, right? Constituted by relevance to what actually happened. So it is a significant fact about the universe that you stepped into the road, heard the car horn and stepped out and did not get hit by the car. So that something did not happen, but could have is a significant fact that is ingredient in what did actually happen. This is the type of universe that Whitehead lives in. Um, 
And it's different from a view of the universe as just this deterministic mechanism where the only thing that matters is what actually happened. There are no possibilities ingredient in a deterministic mechanism, right? There is only actuality and the algorithmic unfolding of necessity as that uh, mechanism requires, right? Whitehead is articulate, articulating an organic view of the universe as a creative becoming, and the way he does this is, is to talk about um, propositional feelings as an important part uh, of how the world becomes, right? It's not only what actually happens that's important, it's what could happen, what could have happened or what could as yet still happen uh, that helps to structure the nature of reality. So normally when we, when we talk about a proposition, a proposition has a subject and a predicate, right? We say that um, the flower is red, right? The flower is the subject and red is the predicate. So the predicate is somehow qualifying the subject. Uh, so in Whitehead's way of thinking about this, what is the subject of a propositional feeling? Well, it's a definite set of actual occasions in a nexus of relationships. What is the predicate? It's a definite set of eternal objects, right? So for Whitehead, the predicate of a proposition defines a potentiality for relatedness among the subjects or the actual occasions, right? So then a really important distinction that Whitehead makes here about propositions is to say that they're not just linguistic. Uh, logicians have often talked about propositions as material for judgment. Uh, we judge whether a proposition is correct or incorrect. Whitehead is pushing propositions way below the level of linguistic reflection and rooting them in the body, rooting them in physical process as such, right? And so he distinguishes conscious judgments, the sort of thing that logicians do and that human beings do all the time, by saying, you know, a judgment about a proposition, it's a, it's a critique of a propositional feeling at the level of consciousness, right, which only high-grade organisms have the capacity for, and we judge whether um, a propositional feeling is correct or incorrect. Now, propositional feelings can be true or false, which is to say that um, when we experience a proposition, uh, it could be that the predicate that we're assigning to a logical subject, uh, that the, in other words, the quality that we're attributing to an actual occasion in our environment doesn't actually match up with uh, that actual occasion and the qualities that it's giving to us in the conformal phase um, of our concrescence. But that doesn't mean that this proposition might not be important. For Whitehead, novelty enters into the universe because some propositions can be false and yet still be uh, an ingredient in our experience. So Whitehead will go so far as to say that it is more uh, important that a proposition be interesting than that it be true. Uh, an interesting proposition contributes relevant novelty to the universe and allows the creative advance to nature, uh, the creative advance of nature to unfold uh, in a more beautiful way, right? Whereas an uninteresting proposition that is true is really just repeating the past. So Whitehead tells us that the entire actual world, as well as the infinite array of eternal objects, enters into each proposition. So uh, everything's connected in Whitehead's universe, right? All the actual occasions are connected with one, one another, are mutually apprehending one another. And the way that they mutually apprehend one another involves the ingression of eternal objects or uh, of possibilities. Um, and when we make a proposition, when we experience a propositional feeling, um, in order for that propositional feeling to have a definite meaning, it needs to uh, include all of the possibilities, um, even the ones that are not immediately relevant to the actual situation. And what you know this suggests is that uh, we can never be completely sure of the full meaning implied by a proposition. Um, as Whitehead says, he says, perhaps we are always presupposing some wide society beyond which our imaginations cannot reach. But for the practical purposes of everyday life, we basically have a sense for the, the wide society or the environment or the background within which 
our propositions are are supposed to achieve their relevance, right? We're not conscious of, and we don't um, positively apprehend or positively feel all of the possibilities um, in our propositions, right? We we experience only some uh, small subset of them, and one of the ways uh, that we're able to uh, limit um, our propositions to just that aspect of our environment or society that's relevant to us is through what Whitehead calls indication, right? So the particular uh, actual occasions that are the logical subjects in a proposition must be indicated, and such indications um, are established by sort of demarcating a nexus of actual occasions that are mutually apprehending one another. So a proposition is relevant to only those actual occasions within that nexus. Um, indication works relationally, right? So, you know, when Whitehead's talking about this, and this is on, around page 195, um, there's a way in which uh, when I prehend an actual occasion in my environment, I'm also prehending how it's prehending me and how it's prehending other occasions in our shared environment, in the nexus that we're all included within. And I think one way to uh, understand this in a more everyday sort of way is, you know, when we're experiencing other people, we are looking at other people, but we don't just see them. We see them looking back at us and we see them looking uh, at our shared environment. And so my perception of other people includes their perception of the world, right? And uh, when I come up with a proposition that's meant to indicate that shared world, I'm able to do so because of this sort of mutual recognition of one another and mutual recognition of one another's perspectives on the world. Like, I know what other people can see, or at least I intuit um, what they can see and what they are looking at. And their attention is a part of what I am attending to, right? I'm not just attending to them as they are. I'm attending to how they're propositionally feeling the world, to the possibilities they're considering, right? And we can kind of watch each other's eyes and navigate our um, the, the propositional structure of our shared experience in this way. At the same time, however, Whitehead warns us against assuming that uh, the verbal phraseology by which we attempt to articulate a propositional feeling um, can differ for, uh, well, so the verbal phraseology can be the same, but the underlying proposition can be different. And he gives the example um, of Caesar crossing the Rubicon, right, the river. And depending on what actual occasion of experience is experiencing that proposition, that verbal phrase, it has a different meaning, right? We could be talking about that phrase um, as it describes a propositional feeling for a soldier in Caesar's army at the time he crossed the Rubicon. We could be talking about it as a proposition in the experience of a historian today who's imagining that uh, past event, right? Or any un a number of other occasions of experience considering a proposition whose phrase whose verbalization sounds the same, but because a different subject is considering it, because a different actual occasion of experience is considering it, well, its meaning as a proposition is quite different, right? So even though the same verbal uh, phraseology is used, that doesn't necessarily mean that the underlying propositional feeling is identical, right? Language is a very blunt instrument. And when Whitehead's talking about propositions, he's not just talking about sentences. Um, on the other hand, this whole chapter on propositions is Whitehead's attempt to secure uh, kind of the conditions for the possibility of his own metaphysical statements, right? He's making metaphysical propositions throughout process and reality, and he's securing um, the possibility of, of what he is doing as a philosopher by describing um, the reality of propositional feelings in the way that he is. So he's using verbal phrases to try to capture uh, the structure of reality, but he's also warning us that, you know, language is the only tool we have, but we should not um, mistake it for a precision instrument. Even mathematics, uh, he says, is, is uh, 
is obscure in what it's actually attempting to indicate, right? So he'll talk about arithmetic and the simple uh, mathematical equation, 1 plus 1 equals 2. And, you know, he'll say that, you know, this might seem straightforward enough, um, but the thing is, um, in order for us to apply 1 plus 1 equals 2 in the actual world, certain a certain character of the societies dominating our cosmic epoch must be presupposed, right? So the fact that we can distinguish objects and say there's one and there is another is a special feature of our cosmic epoch having to do with, you know, the evolution of, of, of particles uh, and, and, and energy and matter in the course of this particular universe. And that, you know, metaphysical truths are far more general than what emerges in the course of time within this cosmic epoch. So the statements that are true of our cosmic epoch may not be metaphysical statements. They might be more specific statements, only holding true of our unique situation embedded in the, uh, right, the societies and the forms of order constituting our environment. 1 plus 1 equals 2 seems straightforward and abstract enough, but, um, you know, Whitehead says, he says, quote, there is no difficulty in imagining a world in which arithmetic would be an interesting, fanciful topic for dreamers, but useless for practical people engrossed in the business of life. In fact, he continues, we seem to have been only barely rescued from such a state of things. Uh, so he, he, he then says that actual occasions located in the wilds of so-called empty space give no indication of any enduring objects capable of being counted. So for Whitehead, remember, an enduring object is a society of actual occasions uh, with a definite characteristic, which is ingressed in the form of eternal objects that repeat over the course of a historical route um, to generate an enduring object. Um, so a statue, for example, the statue of David, uh, of David in, in, in Florence, it seems to be an enduring object. But if we examine it using the metaphysical scheme that Whitehead has articulated, based on contemporary physics, we see that actually that seemingly stable enduring object is made up of a series of vibratory patterns uh, that are stable through some span of time, but uh, if we sped up time, we'd see it decaying and eventually it's going to crumble into dust, right? So um, this is a world of process, right? And for mathematics to be practically applicable, even if something as simple as the arithmetical statement 1 plus 1 equals 2, certain special conditions must hold, right? Because for Whitehead, uh, a metaphysical proposition must be general, general enough that it has meaning for any actual occasion, right? That its predicate, um, a metaphysical proposi proposition's predicate must potentially relate to any and every set of occasions in the universe, that it, and it, that it has a universal or uniform truth value across all cosmic epochs, right? Um, so Whitehead's not even sure we can actually claim to have access to or to possess any metaphysical propositions. He's striving for that, but everything he's saying could in fact only be true of our cosmic epoch. Uh, he's uh, kind of somewhat um, self-assured that he's found something that's metaphysically generic, but... He's just admitting the difficulty of that enterprise, uh, that even something as simple as 1 plus 1 equals 2 may in fact not be as simple, metaphysically speaking, as we at first imagine. Okay, so I have to say just a little bit more about the propositions, chapter 9, sorry about that. Whitehead, in this chapter, tries to justify or ground uh, statistical theory, right? The theory of probability. And he points out the way in which, um, you know, oftentimes we make statistical claims uh, that rest on uh, quicksand. Um, you know, for example, one of the, the statistical claims that most baffles me, um, I'm not a mathematician or a statistician, but I, I have trouble grokking what exactly is being said when, say, cosmologists will say that, um, oh, well, life is very, is highly improbable or that the emergence of our universe out of the, the quantum vacuum is highly improbable. Well, based on, on what ground of uh, probability are you saying that it is improbable that our universe would emerge, or that life would emerge, or that consciousness would emerge? Uh, 
uh, what's the baseline here? And like, wh- how do we determine how likely it is or isn't for the only universe we've ever known to come into being, right? There's nothing to compare it to to say that it's more or less likely. Whitehead is cr- critiquing this sort of use of statistics, I think. Um, and what he's also trying to point out, though, is that there is a ground for probabilistic reasoning or for induction, right? Induction is this form of reasoning whereby we can uh, generalize what has happened in the present so that it applies to the future. It's essential for science, right? And it's essential for everyday life. Um, If we're not able to generalize what has happened to us uh, to make predictions about what's going to happen next, we have no way of of living um, effectively, right? So he does want to justify inductive reasoning. He does want to find some justification for for a probabilistic reasoning. Uh, And he does that, again, by um, referring to the nexus of relationships of actual occasions in our given environment. He says that every actual occasion is in its nature essentially social. Okay, this is the starting point. Every actual entity is essentially social. Uh, And he says that the outlines of its own character are determined by the data which its environment provides for its process of feeling, right? So every actual occasion depends on its environment because that environment is the source of its character, right? You can't have, it's, it's a way of thinking about organisms and environments in a mutually constitutive way, right? You don't get organisms without environments, And really, what is the environment but other organisms in a co-evolving relationship with one another? Uh, And Whitehead then says that the data upon which the subject passes judgment are themselves components conditioning the character of the judging subject. So then, how are inductive judgments possible? How do we make generalizations from past or present experience into the future? Uh, So inductive judgments of future possibilities presuppose the inheritance of the present social environment conditioning the judging subject, right? So a judging subject can infer the future based on an intuition uh, of of its own social environment in the present. And knowing um, that that social environment will remain the environment into the future, maybe not indefinitely, but at least into the immediate future, um, it can make predictions about how the actual occasions in that environment um, will behave. Uh, because you know, for Whitehead, the so-called laws of nature, they're really, they're habits, right? They're, they're habits of nature, and they're the outcome of the social environment. The laws or the habits of nature are the cumulative effect of the decisions of all the actual occasions in the environment that those habits or those laws uh, hold true within. So we can make inductive generalizations because we uh, feel confident in the social relationships that are forging our experience from moment to moment. Um, An inductive generalization, a prediction about the future is possible, and there's grounds for such predictions, Whitehead tells us, because of the strength of each actual occasion's relationships to the society or societies of which it is a part. Okay, so chapter 10 on process. This is a really uh, important chapter that I think helps clarify um, Whitehead's project, right? He's kind of reviewing and summarizing a bit stepping back, taking in the big picture. So he starts with uh, saying that the idea that all things flow, which was first articulated at the very origins of Western philosophy and Heraclitus, who said panta re, all things flow, or the the flux of things, uh, this statement for Whitehead is an ultimate generalization for philosophy. He thinks that, mm, you know, we can be pretty sure that this is a metaphysical proposition. It holds true of every actual occasion in this and other cosmic epochs. All things flow. Uh, But he goes on to ask, what sort of things are flowing, right? And how do they all hang together? Um, He also needs to make room for the permanence of things. Yes, 
all things are in flux, all things flow, but somehow there's also uh, permanence, there is stasis. We can recognize uh, the same thing and say, oh, th there it is again, right? Uh, there's the statue of David again. I visited it a few years ago, and it's still here, standing in the same place. Obviously, underlying that permanence and that endurance are um, processes, right? Energetic uh, pulsations and quantum events and so on. But there is also this degree of permanence amidst the flux. And Whitehead thinks we need to do justice to both, right? The problem for metaphysics is holding permanence and flux together as parts of one universe. How do the two participate uh, in one another such that they uh, bring forth the universe that we know? So, you know, Whitehead references Plato and Aristotle. Uh, he says that Plato, I think, for example, most prominently in his dialogue Timaeus, is trying to include both uh, permanence and flux, right? Stasis and process. Um, but Whitehead says, uh, I quote, for Plato, the things which flow are imperfect in the sense of limited and definitely exclusive of much that they might have been or might be, but are not, right? This is Plato's perspective, uh, that the things which flow, the things which are part of the realm of becoming, of our sensory experience, the physical world, these are imperfect copies of the ideal reality made of eternal forms, right? That's the Platonic perspective. Now, Aristotle uh, was more of a thinker of processes of generation. Um, he was a master of generation, Whitehead says, and he corrected Plato's tendency in Whitehead's terms to, quote, separate a static spiritual world from a fluent world of superficial experience. Uh, Whitehead is inheriting Plato. He's a Platonic philosopher to the core, but... In the same way that he inverts Descartes and he inverts Kant, he inverts Plato, right? So rather than the ideal eternal forms being what's most real, for Whitehead, those eternal forms or eternal objects are deficient in actuality. And what's most real for Whitehead, according to his ontological principle, if you remember back uh, to Module 1, what's most real for Whitehead are actual occasions of experience. And eternal objects, eternal forms are only effectual or only actual in the experience, right, of subjects, of actual occasions. And it's actual occasions which decide which eternal objects to ingress to characterize their experience. Actual occasions have the agency. Actual occasions have uh, the, the power. Eternal objects are what actual occasions use uh, to characterize, to intensify uh, their experience, right? So it's an inversion of Plato. What's most real is actuality, not ideality, for Whitehead. And Whitehead here references uh, the French philosopher Bergson and says that he supports uh, Bergson's charge that the intellect tends to spatialize the universe, right? By ignoring its fluency, its process, its flux, and trying to analyze everything according to static categories, right? This is Bergson's uh, principal uh, condemnation of the philosophical tradition in the West, is that it falsely spatializes uh, process. It falsely spatializes uh, the universe and backgrounds the temporal dimension, backgrounds the creative advance. And so Whitehead agrees with Bergson uh, on this point, and he's trying to develop his own more fluid categories to interpret uh, this universe of becoming. Now, two of the categories he develops uh, to understand process are concrescence and transition. These are Whitehead's two types of process, right? Concrescence has to do with the real internal constitution of a particular existent, right? It has to do with the final cause of an individual actual occasion moving towards its subjective aim and its satisfaction, right, which is its each actual occasion's way of unifying the multiplicity of the world that it inherits, right, into its own perspective. It has a subjective aim drawing it towards that. That is its final cause, and it perishes 
then becomes a superject, it becomes objectively immortal, right? The other form of process is the process of transition. Transition is the process um, of, uh, of transition from a particular existent to another particular existent. It's what happens when a concrescence achieves satisfaction, becomes a superject, hands itself off uh, to the next concrescence, right? So concrescence is what's internal to each actual occasion. Transition is what is the process whereby one occasion inherits its prior or, or antecedent occasion, right? Transition is the, is the, is the process of perpetual perishing, um, it's where efficient cause comes in. So concrescence is final causation. Transition is efficient causation. So, you know, earlier Whitehead told us that every actual occasion is essentially social. And here uh, he says pretty much the same thing in a different way. He says there is no element in the universe capable of pure privacy, right? Because of this process whereby there is concrescence, which is a private experience, but concrescence perishes and becomes and transitions to the next occasion of experience, right? So as we heard earlier, there's this um, rhythmic process of publicity to privacy, back to publicity again, right? So that's the end of this lecture. It's the longest one so far in our course, and it's covering some of the most difficult aspects of Whitehead's text, Process and Reality, that we have yet encountered. Um, you know, if you have mostly questions and confusions uh, in the discussion forum, that's fine. Let's talk about it. Um, we, we'll talk about it in our video conference as well. Um, the part of this uh, five chapters that I really want you to focus on is right at the end in this chapter 10. Read Whitehead's account of the phases of concrescence starting on page 212 and going through about page 215, where he talks about how concrescence can be analyzed as a process of feelings that reveals these three uh, phases, right? He says there's first a responsive or conformal phase. There is next a supplemental stage, which includes aesthetic and intellectual sub-phases. And there is finally the satisfaction. Uh, reading these through, read it a few times if you need to, these couple pages will really give you a strong grasp of uh, what Whitehead means when he talks about the process of concrescence and how we can analyze it. I, I think, I hope um, that he's clear enough here uh, that you will get um, an understanding of what concrescence means, which is a core concept for his philosophy. All right, I'll see you in the discussion forums and in our video conferences. Thanks for listening, guys.